Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. My name is Tamara Pesek. This is the Visiting Speaker Series. I'm glad you could all join us this afternoon for Cory Doctorow's talk. Um, Cory's one of those annoying autodidacts that seems to know a lot about everything and has read all those books and papers that you keep on meaning to read so you can have smart conversations at cocktail parties but never get around to. Cory actually does that stuff. Um, so he can talk intelligently about politics and the law and society and technology and how they all intersect. And he's just incredibly fascinating, fascinating character, and I'm so glad that he could come. Um, besides all of those things, he writes incredible books. You know, he does the whole blog thing. You might have heard about that. Um, and But I think my favorite thing about Corey that I've learned in the small time that I've got to spend with him is that his girlfriend is a professional doom player. Quake. Quake. Yes. X, something like that. But how cool is that? I mean, what kind of... X-Quake player. <laughs> Which is pretty impressive. So with that, please help me welcome Cory Doctorow. Thank you. How about that? Much better. Um, so before I start, for the bloggers in the audience, um, there is a complete text transcript of this that I will give you the U URL of when we're done. So you need not transcribe, um, I, although I won't object to you transcribing. I suspect that my uh, text that I'm reading from will be slightly more faithful than your transcription, having tried to do this many times when people spoke. And I would much prefer to see you blog what you think about what I'm saying than rather than what I'm saying. Um, so I don't often write out talks, but I, I have written it out today. And when I'm done, I'll send you the URL or post the URL, write it up on the board. Uh, the talk starts like this. Greetings, fellow pirates. R. <laughs> I'm here to talk to you today about copyright technology and digital rights management. I work for Electronic Frontier Foundation on copyright stuff mostly, and I live in London. I'm not a lawyer. I'm kind of a mouthpiece activist type, uh, though occasionally they shave me and put me in my bar mitzvah suit and send me off to a standards body or the UN to stir up trouble. I spend about three weeks a, week, uh, a month on the road doing completely weird and random stuff like going to Microsoft and talking about DRM. I lead a double life. Uh, I'm also a science fiction writer. That means that I've got a dog in this fight uh, because I've been dreaming of making my living from uh, my writing since I was 12 years old. Admittedly, my IP-based business isn't as big as yours, but I guarantee you that it's every bit as important to me as yours is to you. So here's what I'm here to convince you of. One, that DRM systems don't work. Two, that DRM systems are bad for society. Three, that DRM systems are bad for business. Four, that DRM systems are bad for artists. And finally, five, that DRM are, is a bad business move for Microsoft. It's a big brief, this talk. Microsoft has sunk a lot of capital into DRM and spent a lot of time sending folks like Martha and Brian and Peter around to various smoke-filled rooms to make sure that DRM, Microsoft DRM finds a hospitable home in the future world. Companies like Microsoft steer like big old Buicks, and this issue has a lot of forward momentum that will be hard to soak up without driving that engine block back into the driver's compartment. At best, I hope Microsoft might convert some of that momentum on DRM into angular momentum and in so doing, save all of our asses. So let's dive into it. Part one, DRM systems don't work. This, is, this part breaks down into two parts. A quick refresher course in crypto theory and applying that uh, to DRM. Now, cryptography, secret writing, is the practice of keeping secrets. It involves three parties, a sender, a receiver, and an attacker. And of course, we can have more than that, but for the sake of clarity, we'll limit it to three. And we usually call these people Alice, Bob, and Carol. So let's say we're in the days of the Caesar, uh, the Peloponnesian Wars. And you need to send messages back and forth to your generals. You'd prefer the enemy didn't get hold of them. So you can rely on the idea that anyone who intercepts a message is illiterate, but that's a tough bet to stake your empire on. You can put your messages into the hands of trusted messengers who will chew them up and swallow them if they're captured. But that's not much good to you if Brad Pitt and his men in skirts skewer them before, before they know what's hit them. So you encipher the message with something like Rot 13, 
where every character is rotated halfway through the alphabet. Don't laugh, it was invented by the Caesars. Rotated halfway through the alphabet. They used to do this with non-work safe material on Usenet back when anyone cared about non-work safe material on Usenet. A becomes B, N, B becomes O, C is P, and so forth. And to decipher, you just add 13 more, so N becomes A, and so on and so on. That's pretty lame. As soon as anyone figures out your algorithm, your secrets are gonzoard. So if you're Caesar, you spend a lot of time worrying about the existence of your messengers, keeping the existence of your messengers and their payloads a secret. You're Augustus, and you need to send a message to Brad without casus, a word that I'm reliably informed means cheese-like or pertaining to cheese, uh, getting his hands on it. So you give your message to Diatomaceus, the fleetest runner in the empire, and you encipher it with Rot 13 and send him out of the garrison at the pitchiest hour of the night, making sure no one knows that you sent it. Cassius has spies everywhere, you see, in the garrison and staked out on the road. And if one of them puts an arrow through Diatomaceus, they'll have their, they'll have their hands on the message, and if they figure out the cipher, you're borked. So the existence of the message is a secret. The cipher is a secret. The cipher text is a secret. That's a lot of secrets. And the more secrets you have, the less secure you are, especially if any of those secrets are shared. Shared secrets aren't that secret anymore. So time passes. Stuff happens. Tesla invents the radio. Marconi takes credit for it. That's good news and bad news for crypto. On the one hand, messages can get to anywhere with a receiver and antenna, which is great news for brave fifth columnists behind enemy lines. On the other hand, anyone with an antenna can listen in on the message, which means that it's no longer practical to keep the existence of messages a secret. Anytime Adolf sends a message to Berlin, he can be reliably assured that Churchill overhears it, which is okay because now we have computers. Big, bulky, primitive mechanical computers, but computers still. Computers are machines for rearranging numbers. And so scientists on both sides engage in a fiendish competition to invent the most cleverest method they can for rearranging numerically represented text so the other side can't unscramble it. The existence of the message isn't a secret anymore, but the cipher is. But this is still too many secrets, for if Bobby intercepts one of Adolf's Enigma machines, he can give it to Churchill, uh, and Churchill gets all kinds of intelligence. This is good news for Churchill and for us, but it's bad news for Adolf. And at the end of the day, it's bad news for anyone who intends to keep secrets. Which brings us to keys. A cipher with a key is a lot more secure. Even if the cipher is disclosed, even if the cipher text is intercepted, without the key or a break, the message is a secret. Post-war, this is doubly important as we begin to realize what I think of as Schneier's Law, that any person can invent a, a security system so clever that he or she can't imagine a way of breaking it. <laughs> This means that the only experimental method we have for discovering if you've made a genuinely secret system, if you've got mistakes in your cipher, is to tell all the smart people you know how it works and ask them to think of breaks. Without this critical step, you eventually end up living in the fool's paradise where your attacker has broken your cipher and is quietly decrypting all of your, all of your intercepts and snickering at you. Best of all, there's only one secret, the key. And with dual key crypto, it becomes still easier for Alice and Bob to keep their secret from Carol, even if they've never met. So long as Alice and Bob can keep their key secret, they can assume that Carol won't gain access to their clear text messages, even though she has the cipher and the cipher text. Conveniently enough, the keys are the shortest and simplest of all of the secrets. Hence, it's e even easier to keep away from Carol. Hooray for Bob and Alice. Now let's apply this to DRM. In DRM, the attacker is also the recipient. It's not Alice and Bob and Carol, it's just Alice and Bob. Alice sells Bob a DVD, she sells Bob a DVD player. The DVD has a movie on it like Pirates of the Caribbean. And it's enciphered with an algorithm called CSS, Content Scrambling System. And the DVD player has a CSS unscrambler. Now let's take stock of what's secret here. The cipher is well known. The cipher text is most assuredly in enemy hands, R. <laughs> so what? So long as the key is secret from the attacker, we're golden. But there's the rub. Alice wants Bob to buy Pirates of the Caribbean. Bob will only buy Pirates of the Caribbean if he can scramble the CSS encrypted VOD, the video object, on, the, on his DVD player. Otherwise, the disc is useful to Bob only as a drinks coaster. So Alice has to provide Bob, her attacker, with the key, the cipher, and the cipher text. Hilarity ensues. <laughs> DRM systems are broken in minutes, sometimes days, rarely months. It's not because the people who think them up are stupid. It's not because the people who break them are smart. It's, because there's a, it's not because there's a flaw in the algorithms. At the end of the day, 
All DRM systems share this common vulnerability. They provide their attackers with the ciphertext, the cipher, and the key. At this point, it's not a secret anymore. So part two is that DRM systems are bad for society. Raise your hand if you're thinking something like, but DRM doesn't have to be proof against smart attackers, only average individuals. It's just a speed bump. No one's thinking that? Some of you are thinking that. Put your hand down. This is a fallacy for two reasons, one technical and one social. They're both bad for society, though. Here's the technical reason. I don't have to be a cracker to break your DRM. I only need to know how to search Google or Kazaa or any other general purpose search tools for the clear text that someone smarter than me has already extracted. Raise your hand if you're thinking, but something like the NGSCB can solve this problem. We'll lock the secrets up in the logic board and goof it all up with epoxy. Thank you, Paul, put your hand down. Um, are there any Darknet authors in the audience? No, well, some of your colleagues wrote a paper called the Darknet paper. Uh, it's a paper that says, among other things, that DRM will fail for this very reason. Here's the social reason that DRM fails. Keeping an honest user honest is like keeping a tall user tall. DRM vendors tell us that their technology is not intended to be proof against, is, is intended only to be proof against average users, not organized criminal gangs like the Ukrainian pirates who stamp out millions of high quality counterfeits. It's not meant to be proof against sophisticated college kids. It's not meant to be proof against anyone who knows how to edit her registry or hold down the shift key at the right moment or use a search engine. At the end of the day, the user that the DRM is meant to defend against is the most unsophisticated and least capable among us. Here's a true story I know about a user who's actually stopped by DRM. She's smart, college educated, and knows nothing about electronics. She has three kids. She has a DVD in the living room and an old VHS deck in the kids' playroom. One day, she brought home the Toy Story DVD for the kids. That's a substantial investment. And given the generally jam-smeared character of everything the kids get their paws on, she decided to take the DVD off to VHS and give that to the kids. That way she could make a fresh VHS copy when the first one went south. She cabled her DVD into her VHS and pressed play on the DVD and record on the VCR and waited. Before I go farther, I want us all to stop a moment and marvel at this. Here is someone who is practically technophobic, but who was able to construct a mental model of sufficient accuracy that she figured out that she could connect the cables in the right way and dub off her digital disk to analog tape. I imagine that everyone in this room is the frontline tech support for someone in his or her family. Wouldn't it be great if all of our non-geek friends and relatives were this clever and imaginative? <laughs> I also want to point out that this is the proverbial honest user. She's not making a copy for her next door neighbors. She's not making a copy and selling it on a blanket on Canal Street. She's not ripping it to her hard drive, DivX encoding it, and putting it in her Kazaa SharePoint. She is doing something fundamentally honest, moving it from one format to another. She's home taping, except she fails. There's a DRM system called Macrovision embedded by law in every DVD player in VHS that messes with the vertical blanking interval in the signal and causes any tape made in this fashion to fail. Macrovision can be trivially defeated for about $10 with a gadget readily available on eBay. But our infringer doesn't know that. That's because she's honest. Technically unsophisticated. Not stupid, mind you, but naive. The Darknet paper uh, addresses this possibility. It even predicts what this person will do in the long run. She'll find out about Kazaa, and the next time she wants to get a movie for her kids, she'll download it from the net and burn it for them. In order to delay this day for as long as possible, our lawmakers and big rights holder interests have come up with a disastrous policy called anti-circumvention. Here's how anti-circumvention works. If you put a lock, an access control, around a copyrighted work, it's illegal to break the lock. It's illegal to make a tool that breaks the lock. It's illegal to tell someone how to make the tool, and it's illegal to tell someone where they can find out how to make the tool. Remember Schneier's Law? Anyone can come up with a system so fiendishly clever that she can't think of a way of breaking it. The only way to find the flaws in security is to disclose the system's workings and invite public feedback. But now we live in a world where any cipher used to fence off a copyrighted work is off limits to this kind of feedback. That's something that a Princeton professor named Ed Felton discovered when he submitted a paper to an academic conference on the failings in the Secure Digital Watermarking Initiative, a watermarking scheme proposed by the recording industry. The RIAA responded by threatening to sue his ass if he presented it. We fought them because Ed is the kind of client that impact litigators love, unimpeachable and clean cut, and the RIAA folded. Lucky Ed. Maybe the next guy isn't so lucky. 
In fact, the next guy wasn't so lucky. Dmitry Skilyarov is a Russian programmer who gave a talk at a hacker con in Vegas on the failings of Adobe's ebook locks. The FBI threw him in the slam for 30 days. He caught the plea, went home to Russia, and the Russian equivalent of the State Department issued a blanket warning to all of their scientists telling them to stay away from America because we turned into the kind of country where some math was illegal. Anti-circumvention is a powerful tool for people who want to exclude competitors. If you claim that your car engine firmware is a copyrighted work, you can, you can sue anyone who makes a tool for interfacing with it. That's not just bad news for mechanics. It's bad news for hot rodders or anyone who wants to get their car fixed for a reasonable price. We, we have companies like Lexmark claiming that the printer cartridges contain copyrighted works, software that trips an I am empty flag when the toner runs out, and has sued a competitor who made software that reversed the I am empty flag when they refilled their cartridges. Even garage door owner, owner companies have gotten in on the act, claiming that the receiver's firmware was a copyrighted work. Copyrighted cars, print cartridges, and garage door openers. What's next? Copyrighted light fixtures? Even in the context of legitimate or traditional copyrighted works, like movies on DVD, anti-circumvention is bad news. Copyright is a delicate balance. It gives creators and their assignees some rights, and it reserves some rights to the public. For example, an author has no right to prohibit anyone from transcoding books to, to, into assistive formats for the blind. More importantly, though, a creator has very limited say over what you can do once you lawfully acquire her works. If I buy your book, your painting, or your DVD, it belongs to me. It's my property, not my intellectual property, a wacky kind of pseudo-property that's Swiss cheese with exceptions, easements, and limitations, but real, no fooling, actual tangible property the kind of thing that courts have been managing through tort law for centuries. But anti-circumvention lets rights holders invent new and exciting copyrights for themselves to write private laws without accountability or deliberation that expropriate your interest in your actual property. Region-coded DVDs are an example of this. There's no copyright here or anywhere that I know of that says that an author should be able to control where you enjoy her creative works once you've paid for them. I can buy a book and throw it in my bag and take it, from, take it anywhere from Toronto to Timbuktu, read it wherever I am. I can even buy books in America and bring them to the UK where the author may actually have an exclusive distribution deal with a local publisher who sells them for double the US shelf price. And when I'm done with it, I can still sell it, give it away, or trade it. Copyright lawyers call this first sale, but you can think of it as just capitalism. The keys to decrypt a DVD are controlled by an organization called DVD-CCA, and they have a bunch of licensing requirements for anyone who gets a key for them. And among these is something called region coding. If you buy a DVD in France, it has a flag that says, I'm a French DVD. Bring that DVD to America, and your DVD player will compare the flag to a list of permitted regions. And if they don't match, it'll tell you that it's not allowed to play your disc. Remember, there is no copyright that says that an author gets to do this. When we wrote the copyright statutes and granted authors the right to control duplication, performance, and display, we, and, and derivative works, and so forth, we didn't leave out geography by accident. This was on purpose. So when your French DVD won't play in America, that's not because it would be illegal for it to do so. It's because the studios have invented a business model and written their own copyright law to back it up. The DVD is your property, and so is the DVD player. But if you break the region coding on the disc, you'll run afoul of anti-circumvention. That's what happened to Jan Johansson, a Norwegian teenager who wanted to watch French DVDs on his Norwegian DVD player. He and his pals wrote some code to break CSS so that he could do so. He want, he's a wanted man here in America. In Norway, the studio has put the local fuzz up to bringing him up on charges of unlawfully trespassing upon a computer system. When his defense asked, which computer system has Jan unlawfully trespassed upon? The answer was his own. His no, fool, no fooling, real and physical property had been expropriated by the weird, notional, and metaphorical intellectual property on his DVD. DRM only works if your record player becomes the property of, whomever, of whomever's records you're playing. Which brings us to point three. DVDs are bad for business, or DRM is bad for business. This is the worst of all of the ideas embodied in DRM, that people who make record players are able to spec whose records you can listen to, and that people who make records should have a veto over the design of record players. We've never had this principle. In fact, we've always had the reverse. 
Think about all the things that can be plugged into a parallel or serial interface, which were never envisioned by their inventors. Our strong economy and rapid innovation are byproducts of the ability of anyone to make things that plug into anything. From the Floby electric razor that snaps onto the end of your vacuum hose to that octopus spilling out of your car's dashboard cigarette lighter, standard interfaces that anyone can build for are what makes billionaires out of nerds. The courts affirm this right again and again. It used to be illegal to plug anything that didn't come from AT&T into your phone jack. They claimed that this was for the safety of the network, but it was really about propping up this little penny ante racket that they had where they could wrench you your phone so long that you paid for it a hundred times over. When that ban was struck down, it created a market for third-party phone equipment, from talking Mickey handsets to answering machines to cordless handsets and headsets. Billions of dollars in economic activity that had been suppressed by the closed interface. Note that AT&T was also one of the big winners here because they got into the business of making phone kit. DRM is the software equivalent of these closed hardware interfaces. Robert Scoble is a softie who has an excellent blog where he wrote an essay about the best way to protect your investment in the, digi in the digital music you buy. Should you buy Apple iTunes music or Microsoft DRM music? Scoble argued that Microsoft's music was a sounder investment because Microsoft would have more downstream licensees for its proprietary format and therefore you'd get a richer ecosystem of devices to choose from when you were shopping for gizmos to play your music on. What a weird idea though that we should evaluate our record purchases on the basis of which recording company will allow the greatest diversity of record players. That's like telling someone to buy the Betamax instead of the Edison Kinetoscope because Thomas Edison is such a weirdo about his patents, all the while ignoring the world's relentless march to the more open VHS format. It's a bad business. DVD is a format where the guy who makes the records gets to tell you about the record players. Ask yourself, how much innovation has there been in DVD in the past, te in the past decade? It might have gotten cheaper and smaller, but where are all the weird and amazing new markets for DVD that were opened up by the VCR? There's a company that's manufacturing the world's first hard disk based DVD jukebox, the first licensed one. A thing that holds 30 movies, and they're charging $30,000 for it. We're talking about a $300 PC and a $300 hard drive. Everything else there is the cost of anti-competition. Which brings us to part four, DRM systems are bad for artists. But what are the artists, the hard-working filmmaker, the ink-stained scribbler, the heroin-cured leathery rock star? <laughs> we poor slobs in the creative class are everyone's favorite poster children here. The RIA and MPA hold us up and say, won't someone please think of the children? <laughs> Foul sharers say, yeah, we're thinking about the artist, but the labels are the man. Who cares what happens to you? To understand what DRM actually does to artists, you need to understand how copyright and technology interact. Copyright is inherently technological, since the things it addresses, copyright, transmission, and so on, or copying and transmission and so on, are inherently technological. The piano roll was the first system for cheaply copying music. It was invented at a time when the dominant form of entertainment in America was getting a talented pianist to come into your living room and pound out some tunes while you sang along. The music industry consisted mostly of sheet music publishers. The player piano was a digital recording and playback system. Piano roll companies would buy sheet music and rip the notes printed on it into zeros and ones on a long roll of computer tape, which they sold by the thousands, the hundreds of thousands, and the millions. They did this without a penny's comp compensation to the music publishers. They were digital pirates. Arr. <laughs> Predictably, the composers and music publishers went nuts. Sousa, John Philip Sousa, showed up in Congress to say this. These talking machines are going to ruin the artistic development of music in this country. When I was a boy in front of every house on summer evenings, you would find young people together singing the songs of the day or old songs. Today, you hear these infernal machines going night and day. We will not have a vocal cord left in America. The vocal cord will be eliminated by the process of evolution, as the tale of man was when he came down from the ape. The publishers asked Congress for a law. They asked them to ban the piano roll and to give them a new law that would say that any system for reproducing music should be subject to a veto from the people who publish music. Lucky for us, Congress realized what side of the bread was buttered, and they decided not to criminalize the dominant form of entertainment in America. But there was the problem of paying artists. The Constitution sets out the purpose of American copyright, to promote the useful arts and sciences. The composers had a credible story that they'd do less composing if they weren't paid for it, so Congress needed a fix. Here's what they came up with. 
Anyone who paid a music publisher two cents would have the right to make one piano roll of any song the publisher published. The publisher couldn't say no, and this is most important, no one had to hire a lawyer at $200 an hour to negotiate whether that would be two cents, three cents, or a nickel. That compulsory license is still in place today. When Joe Cocker sings with a little help from my friends, he pays a fixed fee to the Beatles publisher and away he goes, even if Ringo hates the idea. If you ever wondered how Sid Vicious talked to Anka into letting him get a crack at my way, now you know. The compulsory license created a world where a thousand times more money was made by a thousand times more creators who made a thousand times more music that reached a thousand times more people. The story repeats itself through the history of our technological century, every 10 or 15 years. Radio was enabled by a voluntary blanket license. The music companies got together and asked for an antitrust exemption so they could offer all their music for a flat fee. Cable TV took a compulsory. The only way cable operators could get their hands on broadcasts was to pirate them and shove them down the wire. So Congress saw fit to legalize this practice rather than screw around with their constituents' television. Sometimes the courts and Congress simply decided to take away a copyright. That's what happened with the VCR. When Sony brought out the VCR in 76, the studios had already decided what the experience of watching a movie, a movie in your living room would look like. They'd licensed out their programming for use on a machine called the Disco Vision. This, this played these big LP-sized discs, which disintegrated after a few plays. It was proto-DRM. The copyright scholars of the day didn't give the VCR very good, very good odds. Uh, Sony argued that their box allowed for a fair use, which is defined as a use that a court rules uh, uh, is a defense against infringement based on four factors. Whether the use transforms the work into something new, like a collage, whether it uses all or some of the work, whether the work is artistic or mainly factual, and whether the use undercuts the creator's business model. Well, the Betamax failed on all four of those fronts. Excuse me, I have a cold. I was at the UN last week and I got the black helicopter flu. Um, the Betamax failed on all four of those fronts. When you time-shifted or duplicated a Hollywood movie off the air, you made a non-transformative use of 100% of a creative work in a way that directly undercut the Disco Vision licensing stream. Jack Valenti, the mouthpiece for the motion picture industry, told Congress in 1982 that the VCR was to the American film industry as the Boston Strangler is to a woman home alone. <laughs> But the Supreme Court ruled against Hollywood in 1984 when it determined that any device capable of a substantial non-infringing use was legal. In other words, we don't buy your Boston Strangler business. If your business model can't survive the emergence of this general purpose tool, it's time to get another business model or just go broke. Hollywood found another business model, as the broadcasters had, as the vaudeville artists had, as the music publishers had, and they made more art that paid more artists and reached a wider audience. That's one thing that every new business model has had in common. It embraced the medium that it lived in. This is the overweening characteristic of every single successful new medium. It's true to itself. The Gutenberg Bible didn't succeed on the axes that made a hand-copied monk Bible valuable. They were ugly. They weren't in church Latin. They weren't read aloud by someone who could interpret it for his lay audience. They didn't represent years of devoted with a capital D labor by someone who had given his life over to God. The thing that made the Gutenberg Bible a success was its scalability. It was more popular because it was more profligate. All success factors for a new medium pale besides profligacy. The most successful organisms on the earth are those that reproduce the most. Bugs and bacteria, nematodes and viri. Reproduction is the best of all survival strategies. Is it a quick question or can we hold it to the end? I'm wrong about Gutenberg. Can we, can we take that up at the end? Terrific. Work with me here. <laughs> Piano rolls didn't sound as good as the music of a skilled pianist, but they scaled better. Radio lacked the social elements of live performance, but more people could build a crystal set and get it aimed correctly than could pack into even the largest vaudeville house. MP3s don't come with liner notes. They aren't sold to you by hipper-than-thou record store clerks who can help you make your choice. Bad rips and truncated files abound. I once downloaded a 12-second copy of Hey Jude from the old Napster. Yet MP3 is out competing CDs. I don't even know what to do with CDs anymore. I get them, and they're like that especially nice garment bag you get at, you get at the fancy suit shop. It's nice, and you feel like a goof for throwing it away, but how many can you usefully own? I can put 10,000 songs into my laptop, but a comparable pile of discs with liner notes and so forth, that's a liability. It's just a piece of my monthly storage locker cost. Here are the two most important things to know about computers and the Internet. One, a computer is a machine for rearranging bits. Two, the Internet is a machine for moving bits from one place to another very quickly and cheaply. 
Any new medium that takes hold on the internet and with computers will embrace these two facts and not regret them. A newspaper press is a machine for spitting out cheap and sneery newsprint at speed. If you try to make it spit out fine art lithos, you'll get junk. If you try to make it output newspapers, though, you'll get the basis for a free society. And so it is with the internet. At the heyday of Napster, record execs used to show up at conferences and tell everyone that Napster was doomed because no one wanted lossily compressed MP3s with no liner notes and MP3 and truncated files and misspelled metadata. Today, we hear ebook publishers tell each other and anyone who will listen that the barrier to ebooks is screen, screen resolution. It's bollocks, and so is that whole sermonette about how nice a book looks on your bookcase and how nice it smells and how easy it is to slip into the tub. These are obvious and untrue things, like the idea that the radio will catch on once they figure out how to sell you hot dogs during the intermission, or that movies will really hit their stride when they figure out how to bring the actors out for an encore for when the, once the film is done, or that what the Protestant Reformation really needed was Gutenberg Bibles with facsimile illustrations in the margin and a rent-a-priest to read aloud to you from your personal word of God. New media don't succeed because they're like the old media, only better. They succeed because they're worse than the old media at the things that the old media are good at. And they're better than the old media at the things that the old media were bad at. Books are good at being paper white, high resolution, low infrastructure, cheap and disposable. Ebooks are good at being everywhere in the world at the same time for free in a form that's so malleable that you can just paste bomb it into your IM session or turn it into a page a day mailing list. The only really successful e-publishing, I mean hundreds of thousands, millions of copies distributed in red, is the bookware scene, where scanned and OCR books are distributed on the darknet. The only legit publishers with any success at e-publishing are those whose books cross the internet without, without technological fetter. Publishers like Bain and my own, Tor, who are making some or all of their catalogs available in ASCII and HTML and PDF. The hardware dependent ebooks, the DRM use and copy restricted ebooks, they're cratering. Sales are measured in the tens or sometimes the hundreds. Science fiction is a niche business, but when you're selling copies by the ten, that's not even a business anymore. It's just a hobby. Every one of you has been riding a curve where you read more and more words off of more and more screens every day through most of your professional careers. It's zero sum. We've also been reading fewer words off of fewer pages as time went by. That dinosauric executive who prints his email and dictates a response to his secretary is info roadkill. Today, at this very second, not in some future where paper white displays are possible, people read words off screens for every hour they can find. Your kids stare at their Game Boys until their eyes fall out. Euro teens ring doorbells with their hypertrophied SMS twitching thumbs instead of their index fingers. Paper books are the packaging that books come in. Cheap printer binderies like the Internet Bookmobile that can produce a full bleed, four color, glossy cover, printed spine, perfect bound book in 10 minutes for a dollar are the future of paper books. When you need an instance of a paper book, you generate one, or part of one, and pitch it out when you're done. I landed at SeaTac on Monday and burned a couple CDs for my music collection to listen to in the rental car. When I drop the car off, I'll leave them behind. Who needs them? Whenever a new technology has disrupted copyright, we've changed copyright. Copyright is not an ethical proposition. It's a utilitarian one. There is nothing moral about paying a composer tuppence for the right to make his piano roll, and there's nothing immoral about not paying Hollywood studios for the right to tape your movies. That's just the best way of balancing, out, balancing things out so that people's physical property rights in their VCRs and phono records are respected, and so the creators get enough of the dangling carrot to go on making shows and music and books and paintings. Technology disrupts copyright, does so be because it simplifies and cheapens creation, reproduction, and distribution. The existing copyright businesses all exploit inefficiencies in the old systems for reproduction, production, and distribution, and they'll be weakened by new technology. New technology always gives us more art with a wider reach. That's what new technology is for. Tech gives us bigger pies that more artists can get a bite out of. That's been tacitly acknowledged in, at every stage of the copy fight since the piano roll. When copyright and technology collide, and technology collide, it's copyright that changes. Which means that today's copyright, the thing that DRM nominally props up, didn't come down off the mountain on two stone tablets. It was created in living memory to accommodate the technical reality created by the last generation of inventors. To abandon invention now robs tomorrow's artists of the new business and new reach and new audiences that the internet and the PC can give them. 
Which brings me to the final part, part five, why Microsoft and DRM are a bad business move. When Sony brought out the VCR, it made a record player that could play Hollywood's records, even if Hollywood didn't like the idea. The industries that grew up on the back of the VCR, movie rentals, home taping, camcorders, even bar mitzvah videographers, made billions for Sony and its cohort. This was good business. Even though Sony lost the Betamax VHS format wars, the money on, on, the world, on the world with VCR's table was more than enough to make up for it. But then Sony acquired a relatively tiny entertainment company and started to screw up pretty massively. When MP3 rolled around and Sony's Walkman customers were clamoring for a solid state MP3 player, Sony let its business unit, music, uh, music business unit run its show. Instead of making a high capacity MP3 Walkman, Sony shipped its music clips, low capacity devices that played brain damaged DRM formats like Real and OpenAG. They spent good money engineering features into these devices that kept their customers from freely using, moving their music back and forth between their devices. Customers stayed away in droves. Today, Sony is dead in the water when it comes to Walkman. The market leaders are pokey Singaporean outfits like Creative Labs, the kind of company that Sony used to crush like a bug back before it got bored by its entertainment unit, and PC companies like Apple. That's because Sony shipped a product there was no market for. No Sony customer woke up this morning and said, damn, I wish Sony would devote some expensive engineering effort in order that I may do less with my music. <laughs> Presented with an alternative, Sony's, and customers enthusiastically, Sony's customers enthusiastically jumped ship. The same thing happened to a lot of people that I know who used to rip their CDs to WMA. You guys sold them software that produced smaller, better sounding rips than MP3 rippers, but you also fixed it so that the songs that you ripped were device locked to your PCs. What that meant is that when you backed up your music to another hard drive and reinstalled your operating system, something that's more and more common in these days of the spyware wars, they discovered that after they restored their music, they could no longer play it. The players saw their new OS as a different machine and locked them out of their own music. There is no market demand for this feature. <laughs> None of your customers want you to make expensive modifications to your products that make backing up and restoring even harder. And there is no moment when your customers will be less forgiving of your failings than the moment at which they are recovering from catastrophic data loss. I speak from experience. Because I buy a new PowerBook every 10 months, and because I always order the new models the day they're announced, I get a lot of lemons from Apple. That means that I hit Apple's three iTunes authorized computers limit pretty early on and found myself unable to play the hundreds of dollars worth of iTunes songs that I bought because one of my authorized machines was a lemon that Apple had broken up for parts, one was in the shop getting fixed by Apple, and the third was my mom's computer, 3,000 miles away in Toronto. If I had been a less good customer for Apple, I would have been fine. If I had been a less enthusiastic evangelist for Apple's products, if I hadn't shown my mom how cool that new iTunes music store was, I would have been fine. If I hadn't bought so much iTunes music that burning it to CD and re-ripping it and then re-keying in all of my metadata was such a pain in the ass, I would have been fine. As it was, though, Apple rewarded my trust, evangelism, and out-of-control spending by treating me like a crook and locking me out of my own music at a time when my power book was in the shop, that is to say, at a time when I was hardly disposed to feel very generous towards Apple. I'm an edge case here, but I am the leading edge case. If Apple succeeds in its business plan, it will only be a matter of time until even average customers have upgraded enough hardware and bought enough music to end up where I am. Apple sells an iPod that holds 10,000 songs. You know what I would totally buy? I would totally buy a record player that let me play everyone's records. Right now, the closest I can come to that is an open source app called VLC, but it's clunky and buggy and it didn't come pre-installed on my computer. Sony didn't make a Betamax that only played the movies that Hollywood was willing to permit. Hollywood asked them to do that, actually. They proposed an early analog broadcast flag that VCRs could hunt for and respond to by disabling recording. Sony ignored this and made, their product, made the product they thought that their customers wanted. I'm a Microsoft customer. Like millions of other Microsoft customers, I want a player that plays anything I throw at it, and I think that you're just the company to give it to me. Yes, this would violate copyright law as it now stands, but Microsoft has been making tools of piracy that change copyright law for decades now. Outlook, Exchange, and MSN are tools that abet wide-scale digital infringement. More significantly, IAS and your caching proxy products all make and serve copies of documents without their author's consent, something that, if it's legal today, is only legal because companies like Microsoft went ahead and did it and dared lawmakers to, to, uh, to prosecute. 
Microsoft stood up for its customers and for progress, and won so decisively that most people never even realized that there was a fight. Do it again. This is a company that looks the world's roughest, toughest antitrust regulators in the eye and laughs. <laughs> Compared to antitrust people, copyright lawmakers are panty wastes. <laughs> you can take them with both arms behind your back. In Siva Vadhyantan's book, The Anarchist in the Library, he talks about why the studios are so blind to their customers' desires. It's because people like you and me spent the 80s and 90s telling them bad science fiction stories about impossible DRM technology that would let them charge a small sum of money for every time everyone, anyone looked at a movie. Want to fast forward? That feature costs another penny. Pausing is two cents an hour. The mute button will cost you a quarter. When Macro Analysis issued their report last month advising phone companies to stop supporting Symbian phones, they were just writing the latest installment of the story. Macro says that phones like my P900, which can play MP3s as ringtones, are bad for the cell phone economy because it'll put the extortionate ringtone providers out of business. What Macro is saying is that just because you bought the CD doesn't mean that you should expect to have the, the ability to listen to it on your MP3 player. And just because it plays on your MP3 player is no reason to expect it to play as your ringtone. I wonder how they feel about alarm clocks that play a CD to wake you up. Is this strangling the nascent alarm tone market? <laughs> but the phone company's customers want Symbian phones, and for now at least, the phone companies understand that if they don't sell these, someone else will. The market opportunity for a truly capable device is enormous. There's a company out there charging $30,000 for, for a $600 DVD jukebox. Go and eat their lunch. Steve Jobs isn't going to do it. He's been off at the D conference telling studio executives not to release high-def movies until they're sure no one will make a high-def DVD burner that works with a PC. Maybe they won't buy into his BS, but they're also not much interested in what you have to sell at the moment. At the broadcast protection discussion group meetings where the broadcast flag was hammered out, the studio's position is, we'll take anyone's DRM except Microsoft's and Philips. When I met with the UK broadcast wonks who are working on the European version of this at the Digital Video Broadcasters Forum, they told me, well, it's different in Europe. Mostly we're just worried that some American company like Microsoft will get between us and our customers. American film studios don't, didn't want the Japanese electronics companies to get a piece of the movie pie, so they fought the VCR. Today, everyone who makes movies agrees that they don't want to let you guys get between them and their customers. Sony didn't get permission. Neither should you. Go build the record player that can play everyone's records, because if you don't do it, someone else will. Thank you. So, maybe we should start with Gutenberg. Do you all go to the Roman Library? Check out the Gutenberg Bible there. Is that in German? I'm Turkish. Right. Uh, no, but they weren't in church Latin. The, the Luther Bibles were in Latin. Oh, the Gutenberg Bibles. Well, so I beg your pardon, I conflated them. Thank you all. I'll correct that. Other questions? Mark. Great argument for cultural products. What about my medical records? What about your medical records? Don't I want to put some bits in my holes and keep other people out of those bits? So we can talk about whether or not IRM is a good business for Microsoft, but it's an entirely qu different question from this. I think IRM has some failings, and I think that, that uh, in particular, the, the IRM question about privacy uh, mistakes the social character of privacy. Uh, like security, you can only be private from someone, as, as with security, where you can only be secure from some attack. And typically, the people you want to be private from are the people who are in a position of power over you. And I think that it's likely in the field that what will happen is um, the people who are in power over us will insist that we use their DRM wrapper. Right? The day that I can tell the IRS that I'm going to give them my financial records and my DRM wrapper that I can revoke after seven years is the day that I don't even have to worry about the IRS. Right? If, I, I, if I had that much power over the IRS today, I think I'd have... Uh, I think, I think I wouldn't need the technology, to be frank. But I think that's a separate question from the question about whether or not um, uh, DRM is a good business model for Microsoft. Uh, I don't think there's any implicit contradiction in Microsoft saying we will do this and not that. Sony is at root an IP business. Sony vigorously defends their patents. That's why they lost the format wars. Sony went on to win the, win the right for the Betamax to exist and then sued everyone who made a Betamax. Right? They're, they, it, it, it's, there's, 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 IP law is not a, a big kind of monolithic moral property, uh, moral, moral uh, proposition rather. IP law is a whole bunch of little individual localized policies that all have the same objective of promoting invention. And what works over here doesn't always work over there. 
It's a good question. So I, I'll point out first that we didn't always, that not all of the successful models have actually involved compensating artists. Um, a good number of them have actually involved just saying, if you can't figure out how to make a living here, someone else will. Uh, that's, that's the VCR story. But in the case of the ones that did compensate artists, we never had the principle that you had to go and negotiate with all the artists individually. What we did was we created blanket licenses, sometimes voluntary and sometimes compulsory. EFF is actually asking for a blanket license on music. We've, we've asked the music industry to voluntarily propose it, and if they want to do it, we think Congress should impose one on them. And basically, the idea would be that you pay some sum of money every month into a rights society that would be an arm's length body from the, from the music industry that would collect the money and do statistical sampling of what's going on in the network, the same stuff that Bay TSP and uh, Big Champagne are doing today. How would they know the building? If I'm going to one of these peer-to-peer -peer networks, mm -hmm. you know, that's not practical. Yeah, there'd be free riders, and if they caught you, they could prosecute you. That's exactly where they're at today. I mean, that's how radio works. How do they know to build radio stations? There are lots of radio stations that try to get away with it. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. They have auditors. They go out and they find the people. I mean, the system doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to be actuarially accurate and enough to incent art artists to go on creating. I mean, so far, the P2P -P wars aren't doing a real good job of compensating artists. Right. So far, there's not a single DRM or granny sue that has put a penny in the pocket of an artist. Right. That all that stuff has done is erode the uh, character of society and alienate fans from their from their uh, alienate fans from the artists they love. My colleagues in the Science Fiction Writers of America, there are some of them who go around uh, uh, very worried about people who circulate books without permission on the internet. And the, the core line that they have is that my fans are crooks, and unsurprisingly, this doesn't play well with their fans. Um, so. I think that you know we can talk about blanket licenses and alternative compensation schemes, but I think that DRM isn't a compensation scheme, right? Whether or not something else is a compensation scheme, DRM certainly isn't. Are there other questions? Yeah. Yeah. So, so, what are your thoughts on having to pay a mandatory amount per CD? When you buy a blank CD, there's an amount of money that you contribute. Yeah, the levy. So they're, they're actually, <coughs> levies are not always a bad thing. If, if the levy gets you something in return, I'm actually, I'm pretty cool with them. Um, but it doesn't solve my purpose of backing up. Right. So that's, that's where levies become problematic. And the same thing is true if you, if you could imagine an internet service provider that just said, you know, all of our customers will just pay the fee because it's too much of a pain in the ass to, to hassle with it. And besides that, if all of our customers pay the fee to, to download music, we can, we can put local caches on, which means that, A, we can maximize how fast stuff moves between our users, and B, we can minimize the amount of traffic we route across the backbone where we actually pay money. So just keep it all on the router. Um, and, you know, there'd be people who want to just raw bandwidth, people who never use the, the network. And that's, that's analogous to the way the world works today. Uh, I had an Earthlink account when I lived in San Francisco, Earthlink DSL. Uh, it came with email, it came with web hosting, it came with FTP hosting, it came with Usenet access, and it came with dial-up. Um, I used the dial-up and I used the, 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 uh, the DSL. I used the DSL like hell. I had an open access point. There were lots of people using it. I just saturated that line 24-7. And I used the dial-up because I roamed a lot, but I didn't have any use for the email. Um, everyone who had an email account at Earthlink took a free ride on me. Everyone who didn't use their dial-up, I got a free ride on. But at the end of the day, when I went and shopped for someone who would give me a la carte service, it turned out that they wanted more money than Earthlink did. Because by just creating an a la carte, all you can, or rather an all-you-can-eat kind of everything in one basket service, it was cheaper that way. So the question you need to ask is, if the choice is between levy media and non-levy media, look at the difference between DVD and CD. Where CD, there's a levy on it. Um, but there's been so much production of it, it's in use in so many contexts, and it was legit to make it, and there was no barrier to making it, that CD blanks, you can get them for like two and a half cents a throw. DVD blanks, which are fundamentally the same thing, are a dollar a throw. 
And what's the difference between that? It's that there's a, there's, you know, it's, you can lawfully reproduce and sell them by the squillion. And, you know, the, the music industry isn't trying to get in the way of it. So it's, it's not a perfect answer, but it's not a bad trade-off either. I think we all benefit when you legalize what large numbers of people are doing, when you sort of hit your wagon to it. I saw a great presentation from um, uh, one of your hardware guys yesterday who said, you know, there are all these people who are doing all this interesting stuff with uh, LEDs now. You know, they're, they're putting them in car uh, flashlight or car car headlights and so on and so you know LEDs are getting cheaper and better faster than anything else so all of our research is in LEDs not because there's anything inherently great about LEDs but because there's someone else doing a lot of the primary research over there that's the kind of free ride that I think that we can get from file sharing I mean there's not there's not a shortage of people who will line up to to make that into a giant popular industry I and mean, it's the fastest adopted technology in the history of the world Yes, sir. So you're making a logical case that Microsoft or some other company is going to do this. How can you buttress that? How can you, what incentives can you offer besides that they might make money and they're into making stuff? I mean, money's a good well, argument. I, would you be willing to intercede to uh, be an intermediary? I suspect that Microsoft has a pretty good uh, legal team. Um, it doesn't really need the advice of a kind of a half-assed half-lawyer, but... Um, um, uh, well, I think that the, that the argument for this is that uh, part of the value proposition today of using Windows is that all the best file sharing clients run on Windows. Um, and that, you know, if you guys want to want to keep maintaining that value proposition and exploit it, I think that that's, that's the right thing to do as to, you know, what kind of assistance I could offer. I would certainly go around and tell people, yay for Microsoft, they're making a universal record player, and I'd buy one. Uh, and i tell all my friends to buy them, too. I mean, I'm, I, I, I think that a universal record player is a no-brainer sale. Mike. Microsoft makes tools. We have an implementation of social secure software players. But we don't develop the policy of our users in, in terms of whether they encrypt or not. We have a media player. And in that media player, we have you know, some, some very, uh, as you say, nascent DRM. But again, when you install the media player, you get a dialog box that asks you whether you want to, you know, to not allow the reproduction of whatever you're going to report. That's part of the, the, the report part of it. And the default maybe, I don't know where the buttons are, that it, it doesn't allow you to copy, but, but we do provide you the ability to protect that, but we don't provide you, we also provide you the ability not to use the DRM. So again, you know, one thing is, what are you asking Microsoft? Who oh, I, I'd like a real player. I, I'm sorry, you, you, missed, you missed my point. I, I'd like a Windows Media Player that not only had that checkbox, but I'd also like a checkbox that said, would you like to play QuickTime, real, um, uh, M M MP4, uh, uh, and every other format we can imagine, AAC, iTunes music, and so on. I mean, it's not hard to engineer that, right? Once you've got the music in your hands. I mean, DRM systems, people break them. Right? I mean, they, just, they, they technologically don't work. Like, I, I, I don't doubt that Microsoft can figure out how to break everyone's DRM formats and give me a Windows Media Player that plays everything. I mean, certainly, like the people who make VLC manage to do it, and they're all like 16 years old. Right? Um, so, you know, give me a good one. Give me one with a nice UI that doesn't crash all the time. And, and where, you know, when I fast forward halfway through the movie, it doesn't go all grainy for about five minutes while it, re while it recalibrates the diff from the last keyframe. And I'd be a happy man. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, you spent a fair amount of time talking about the anti-circumvention provisions of the DMCA and condemning the history of litigation that implicated that statute. I guess my question to you is, on close examination, um, whether in fact that's the proper read of, of that statute. And if you go through the examples that you cited, the RAA backed down in their uh, their uh, uh, claims against Felton. Uh, Skyler Roth was acquitted by the jury. Uh, well, he probably... The company, L. Comstock, went to trial and was acquitted by the jury. Uh, in the garage door opener case, the allegations were rejected by the court. In the Lexmark uh, printer cartridge case, uh, uh, the Copyright Office has gone on the record saying that that should probably fit within the uh, interoperability exceptions to the DMCA. You're aware that there are also security research exceptions to the DMCA. Although they tend to be pretty important. 
And, and, and uh, lastly, Johansson, the teenager in Norway, was acquitted over there. In Norway. In Norway, yes. Where they don't, they don't, where they don't have the same statutes they have. Here. Right. But we've now gone through the list of cases that are frequently cited as well, administrative. There's still 2,600, and there's any number of other cases, too. And there's lots and lots of nasty cases. Right? Once that is available on the books, the number of people who will use it to chill speech is very large. Not everyone can attract an impact litigator to defend their case. And in 2,600, the court went the other way. And, and that was a case that directly implicated the encryption technique that uh, is used by DVDs. Right. Yeah, which is, I mean, the, the core of what the statute is about is protecting copyrighted works. The parade of horribles, as mentioned, is that it has an impact in other situations. And the, the Well, but the on Johansson is just the same thing, right? The, the 2600 publishing DCSS was just as readily useful for moving a DVD to your hard drive, taking a DVD and, and, and watching it in another country, and so on, as, as it was in Jan Johansson's case. And the court was pretty, pretty unambiguous about how it felt about circumvention in that instance. In that instance, that's right. That's, yeah. that, that's a much more narrow well, it's situation. Well, yeah, it's the same as Johansson. It's the same principle. But once you put someone's record on your record player, you stop owning your computer. It there, but in the parade of horribles and the other situations, right. from garage door openers to printer cartridges to security researchers, uh, it's not it's not necessarily the case. Well, so Lexmark has a fault. Right, Lexmark is right. still ongoing. We don't know that they'll lose. Still, still in the courts with the copyright office taking the position they should lose. And in, and in Bnet D, well, but that doesn't mean that the courts will will follow what they say. And in Bnet D. We're, we're still, with it, you know, those guys had to back down because they ran out of time and money, uh, and that was the that was the same kind of thing. So not all the things get litigated to final judgment because it's hard to find an impact litigation. Clients will go all the way, um, but I think that I think that it's unreasonable to think that that no one will ever use these in an anti-competitive fashion. In fact, all the evidence points to people using them in anti-competitive fashions and to force their competitors out of the market. So far, unsuccessfully. Well, given that there's an ongoing litigation that hasn't been settled yet. Yeah. I have to say, I think, that, um, if the argument is that this is eventually going to resolve, get resolved, allowing them these exceptions, that's also an argument that, from the Microsoft perspective, that we should be the uh, first mover in this case. So the rest, I don't think that's core to the rest of Corey's arguments. <laughs> Yeah, um, I, heard, I heard a couple of messages from you know, It seems like the thing that's clearly evil is the, the legislation that's outlawing, outlawing barring technology because they think it's dangerous and making criminals of, of everybody. Um, but, but then I thought there was the message of, of the companies that are building this DRM technology that clearly won't work and that oftentimes the engineers building it know don't work and are building it for you know, who knows what the motivation. And I thought that's what you were saying that we should stop doing. But then I heard you say say that maybe what you want is for Microsoft to be the, the scoff clause that that in fact break the rules and dare people to, to sue us. It, is that it, it would seem like it'd be just effective if we built a you know a player that could play a format and then and then pirates or people like EFF were to arrange for publication of things that would translate to that format from anything. And, and the world would get what they needed without without anybody that is a a, 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 a an attractive target for litigation going out on the wind. I think that if there's a fundamentally different proposition when you say uh, let's make let's make a universe let's make the canonical record format and hope everyone transcodes to it than saying we're going to make the record player that plays everyone's records. And I think from a business perspective. It's a lot easier to sell the latter than it is to sell the former. I'm, I'm far more interested as a customer in the thing that plays everyone's records than in the notion that I could convert all my records to your format. What if it's the end of the company? You know, I, I want to be the customer of the company that gives me the universal record player. And I think that if Microsoft is in that company, that someone will be. Um, and I think, that you'll, I think that if Microsoft wants to not end up where Sony did, then that's what they've got to do. I mean, if you look at what um, what the uh, uh, people who outcompeted Sony in the personal stereo market did, they essentially made the thing that played the format that everyone was already using, and played all the formats they could get their hands on. Right? They didn't. They didn't make the thing that played uh, played a format that they hoped everyone would convert it to. In fact, those strategies tend to tend to be tanking. Someone just showed me a, a little uh, printout about a thing. Sony's just developed a, a solid state memory chip. That's uh, like I don't know, like two gigs or something. But it's small and low power draw, and they put it into a Walkman, 
um, but it, it won't play MP3s. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, it's just what the world needs, another non-MP3 MP3 player, you know? Um, I think it's bad business. I think the, I think it's bad product design. I just think I think they're, they're hard to sell because people don't want to own them. They want to own the thing that plays the records they have. They don't want to convert all their records. Corey, in that Sony example, I believe they give you a software or an application that runs on your desktop that does the conversion to their proprietary format on the way of moving the music into the device. Yeah, yeah, and, and Toshiba did that too. They had a thing where you could convert your music on, on the way as it went. It was like the first USB 2 device, but it ran slower than USB because the, the transcoding, which included an encryption step, was actually so slow that it, that it didn't go along. It's basically, it's a feature that costs money to engineer. Every feature costs money to engineer. We can all agree on that. And it's a feature that costs money to engineer that, no, that confers no benefit to the customer. Right? The benefit to the customer is that, the, that Sony's entertainment unit let Sony's electronics unit ship it. But that's, that's, a, that's a very distant benefit to me as compared to the benefit that I can get by buying product from Creative Labs right? or from Apple. How do you feel about music as a subscription rather than a purchase model? Um, so the thing that bugs me about music as a subscription is that I, I believe in property. I like owning stuff. And I, I worry that if I can't ever have, acquire a property interest in my music, that, you know, today I find myself in possession of a lot of music that isn't available anywhere for sale, like 80% of the music ever recorded isn't available for sale. And that the subscriptions kind of, subscriptions are, are, are nice as a kind of, as a, as a market option, but for me personally, as a potential customer for them, I'm completely disinterested in subscription. I want to own the music. I mean, I have subscriptions to magazines, right? It's, it's, a weird, it's a weird definition of subscription. Because I have a subscription to Asimov Science Fiction Magazine that I let lapse. But I still have all my old issues of Asimov Science Fiction Magazine. I mean, that's, a, that's a nice subscription model. I used to be an e-music e subscriber. And I, and I own a lot of music that I subscribe to e-music for. That I be, became a non-subscriber, but I got to hold on to the music. The idea of expiryware, from a customer's perspective, I think is pretty, it's, it's, it's not very attractive. You know, and, and ultimately, I think it leads us to that world where they say, well, you know, you bought the, you bought the play rights, but you didn't buy the pause rights. You know, um, you know that's, the, that's the premium subscription. Uh, that's, 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 you know, Master Pro. Um, are we, uh, yep. Yeah. So if Microsoft went ahead and built this universal media player, wouldn't they just get consumed from everywhere? No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you would. You would. But I think that so Sony Sony ended up making a, a whole boatload of money, even minus the cost of all the litigation for making the Betamax. Right, but when Sony did that, they, they were going into gray water. They weren't going out and you know reverse engineering things that the indirect violation of the DMCA. Oh, but they were going against all the copyright precedent. Right? Like, remember that? Like everyone said, you know, fair use, what fair use could this possibly be? You're using 100% of the work. It's not a critical use. You're not a school cutting it up to, to educate people about it. It's a creative work. It's not like a news broadcast. It's like Hollywood movies that cost millions of dollars. There's another business out there that will let you watch a movie in your living room, and you're going to destroy that business, and that's the legitimate business. They, they failed all the four factors. And people were like, you're out of your mind. You know, how can you win this? Not only that, but they did it in the middle of the car wars when Japanese companies weren't getting a lot of shrift here in America. And, and I urge you to actually find the rest of that Jack Valenti speech. If you Google Boston Strangler, you'll find it. Because mostly what that speech is, is, is a speech about how um, American industry, having been, having been demolished by the, the, the evil Japanese who destroyed our car industry with their unfair trade practices, are now gunning for the last remaining viable American industry. It's, it's this crazy kind of xenophobic protectionist rant um, uh, about, about how you know, the entertainment industry will be destroyed by the uncreative Japanese who all they can do is copy, but they can't innovate. Um, it's really, it was really quite amazing. Clearly, he'd never seen any manga. <laughs> yeah, let's we'll think of one more and then I'll, I'll uh, cut and run and sign some books at the beginning of the last time. This is my, my crazy business model. I give away books and sometimes they find people who wouldn't have bought them otherwise and then they buy them and then I guess it's very dot com, but I think it might work. What about the URL to the speech? A URL to the speech? That's a very good question. <laughs> So, we had Vax terminals in the house when I was six, 
So I learned to type before I learned to write properly. My handwriting is just awful, and I apologize for it. Oops. So what's that say? <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll read it aloud. It's craphound.com, C-R-A-P-H-O-U-N-D, forward slash all lowercase M-S-F-T-D-R-M dot T-X-T. And the talk itself is in the public domain. So feel free to reproduce it, take credit for it, try and sell it on, anything you'd like. <laughs> I actually did this with another talk, and um, someone bought it for a textbook and insisted on paying me for it. <laughs> it was very funny. It was like we, our, our, our legal department just doesn't know what to do about this. It's, you say it's in the public domain, but they insist that we pay you for it. <laughs> and I'm grateful for it, although if I were on their board of directors or one of their investors, I suspect I might. Um, I might look for another investor. <laughs> well, thank you all very much.